Good morning, everybody. Uh, lovely to be with you this morning and to those folk in the other venues and at home, wherever you are, it's lovely that we can be together like this. I'm going to tell you an incredible story this morning that actually happened. It's fact from the Old Testament, as has just been read to us. It may have confused you a bit listening to that, but I'm going to explain the whole thing to you. It's from the history part of the Bible, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8 to 23. So I'll run through the story, and then we'll see what it's saying to us from God this morning. I believe it'll strengthen our faith as we go through this incredible happening. It'll encourage us no matter what we're facing in the world today, and it'll help us to be stronger Christians. The time period of this happening was 840 BC, a long time ago. But it is as relevant today as it was then, many years ago. Because God does, doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have the same God that worshipped and ministered there with us this morning. I'm going to give you a bit of a geography lesson just to explain that reading. Uh, so we're back in class, okay, this morning. So concentrate. Imagine there's a big blackboard behind me, and I've drawn at the top of it um, the country of Assyria. Now, the king of Assyria wanted to wipe out Israel, which is at the bottom, south of Assyria. But for some reason, the king of Syria, the top, had been missing the mark, not winning the battles against Israel. Um, it's like Bafana Bafana trying to beat Germany or Brazil at soccer. He was just losing out. And every time he tried to attack Israel, wherever he went, Israel was ready for him. They had their armies. For some reason, Israel knew what was happening when Assyria attacked. So Ben-Hadad, the Syrian king, who was losing all the time, sent for his advisors. And he said to them, what's wrong with my army? Why aren't we winning? Every time I try to attack Israel, they're there ready for us. Wherever we try and surprise them in a new area, they're there. What's going on? But the king of Syria didn't know that God had sent his secret agent, 00777, to the king of Israel to tell him exactly where the Syrian armies were going to attack every time they wanted to attack Israel. So Israel's king couldn't always plan a counterattack and surprise the Syrian army. He, he always had this counterattack. Now this person, the secret agent of God's, was, of course, the prophet Elisha. This happened several times. Syria trying to attack Israel and uh, not managing. Eventually, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, was very upset. And he sent for his advisors, and he said, one of you is a traitor. One of you must be a traitor telling the king of Israel what we're planning and what we're planning to do every time we plan something. And he couldn't understand what was going on, why he was losing. Then one of the advisors from the intelligence department replied, no way, it's not one of us, dear king. It's Elisha in Israel, the prophet Elisha from God in Israel. He knows every move you make, even what you say in your bedroom. Your bedroom is bugged. Uh, that's, I said that, not um, the Bible. In fact, the Bible does say it in uh, verse 12. If you listen carefully, verse 12 of the reading, none of us, my Lord, the king, said one of the officers, but Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. So the king of Syria said, go and find out where this Elisha is, and then I'll get him, sort him out. So they did that and reported back that Elisha was in the city of Dotham in Israel. That's where Elisha lived. So Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, got his horses and chariots and his great army, and he set off, and he surrounded Dotham, where Elisha lived, by night, ready to strike as soon as it was light enough to strike and get his army going. But very early that morning, Elisha's servant got up and he went out onto the balcony or through the door. It was just starting to get light. And what he saw shocked him. The servant looked out and to his shock and amazement, he saw the surrounding army from Assyria that had come ready to attack. And he couldn't believe his eyes. He rushed back to Elisha, the prophet, and he woke him up and said, oh my Lord, what shall we do? And Elisha probably yawned and stretched a bit and woke up and said, uh, and the, the servant said, what, what can we do, Elisha? Wake up, what can we do? There's an army out there. 
And Elisha answered with an amazing reply. I don't know if you noticed it when it was read to us. In verse 16, Elisha said, Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We are more than them. Now, of course, this didn't make sense to the, to the servant because uh, he couldn't see another army, Elisha's army, at all. And he thought this really, Elisha was making it up. So he probably thought Elisha was still half asleep. And he said, Elisha, Elisha, just look out there at, at this, this army from Assyria. They're about to attack us. So Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open my servant's eyes so that he may see. And then we saw in verse 17, and Elisha prayed, O Lord, open the eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now that was God's army. God had sent his own army to surround Elisha and his people in Israel. Now I want you to remember that part of this happening. And uh, when you go home this morning, or when you switch off your TV or, or computer at home, uh, it's an amazing verse, verse 16. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. When the Syrian army approached to attack, Elisha prayed to the Lord to blind the attacking Syrian army's eyes. So God dulled their vision so that they couldn't see well, but they could see enough to walk but they couldn't see where they were going. And Elisha the prophet went out and he called out to the leaders of the opposition army, you're in the wrong place, follow me. And of course they couldn't see very clearly, they couldn't see it was Elisha. And Elisha led them and the Syrian army followed right to Samaria, to another town in uh, Israel where the king of Israel lived, the, the headquarters of the king, the main city. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, now open the eyes of this rebel army. And the Lord did. They must have felt real dodos. And the king of Israel then said to Elisha, shall we kill them all? And Elisha said, no. Then he said something we probably wouldn't have said ourselves. He said, give them water and bread to drink. Don't kill them, rather feed them. But the king even did more than that. He gave them a great meal, as you heard in the reading. And he sent them home with their tails between their legs. That's the story. And the result, so the, 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 the bands of the Syrian armies stopped raiding Israel's territory as a result of this. Now this message today is entitled, The Battle is the Lord's. The Battle is the Lord's. And this happening has so encouraged me that I wanted to encourage you as well this morning. There are three lessons for us that come out of this section about God. Number one, the God who sees. Number two, the God who protects. And number three, the God who shows mercy. First of all, number one, the God who sees everything. Whenever the Syrians planned a border attack, God gave Elisha the information and he warned the king of Israel about the attack coming. And the Lord sees not only the actions of people, but also their thoughts. The Lord knew exactly what was going on. He told Elisha what was going on. Elisha told the king. You all probably know Psalm 139, which is an, an amazing psalm. Um, oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. And then verse 7 carries on. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Not even the best spies could have done a better job. God knows man's plans and thoughts and can intervene as he pleases. Nothing done or said or thought by any person in any place at any time is out of the reach of God's knowledge. God knows that you hear this morning. He knows everything about us. We say to God, Lord, 
I don't know what's going on in my life, what those people are thinking, what's happening, and what the opposition are planning for me. And then God says, my son, my daughter, I do. I know exactly what's going on in your life. I know everything. There's nothing that I don't know. God knows exactly what you are going through in life today at the moment, whether you're here or whether you're at home. He wants to talk, he wants you and each one of us to talk to him about it, to trust him, to go through it with him. The great Luther uh, said the most important thing about prayer is to be honest with God. So what are you feeling? Whatever you're going through, be honest with God. Say, God, I don't understand this. I don't like what I'm going through. I can't handle it. Please help me. Speak to God. God knows. God understands. Make God so much a part of your life that you do nothing without him in life. He understands you. So live in continual presence of God. Bring him into everything, in every part of your life. Number one, the God who sees, who knows us, who understands us. Isn't that encouraging? Then secondly, the God who protects. This servant did the normal thing and turned to his master, Elisha, for help. He said, there's an army out there from the opposition. They're going to attack us and we're going to really be battered up. A woman told evangelist D.L. Moody once that she had found a wonderful verse that gave her peace when troubled. She quoted Psalm 56, verse 3. When I am afraid, I will trust you. Moody said he had a better promise for her and quoted Isaiah 12, 2. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. We wonder what promises from the Lord came to Elisha's mind and heart because it's, it is faith in God's word that brings peace in a storm. Maybe it was David's words in Psalm 27, verse 3. Though an army besiege you, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Have you noticed how many times in the Bible, right through the Bible, God says to us, be not afraid. Be not afraid. I'm with you. I'm with you. Maybe Elisha remember the verses or the, the, the words of Moses from Deuteronomy 20, verse 3 and 4, which says the following. He shall say, Hear, O Israel, today, you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not be terrified or give way to panic before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Notice something interesting. Elisha didn't trouble himself about the army at all. His first concern was for the frightened servant. If a servant going to war, was going to walk with Elisha and serve God for the years ahead, the young man would face many difficult and dangerous situations, and he had to learn to trust the Lord, as we all need to. We would probably have prayed for the Lord to give this lad calmness and peace. But Elisha prayed for God to open his eyes and to see the reality of God, what God was doing, what God was up to. You see, the servant was living by sight and not by faith. And we often live by sight. In fact, we do very often and not by faith. And couldn't see the vast angelic army of the Lord surrounding the city, which God had sent to show the opposition that they were useless against God. Psalm 34 verse 7 says the following. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Who believes in angels? I'm sure many of you do. I see the hands going up. Angels exist. Angels are spoken about in God's word more than 300 times. They are servants of God's servants to God's people. They are God's workmen serving us. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7 says the following. In speaking of angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. And verse 14 carries on. Are, we, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? 
And until we get to heaven one day, we'll never fully know how much angels have helped us, how God has sent angels to help us from different situations. I remember reading a story, and I've heard people quote it to me who were there in, in the old Rhodesia. Remember when the Rhodesia was going through the Bush War? And uh, the, the different farming communities had connections with each other on radio. And this, one day, this, this um, Christian family were surrounded on their farm by uh, uh, soldiers ready to attack their farm, their house. And they quickly got on the phone and got people praying. And then suddenly, this group of strong men who were going to attack the house turned around and went away, disappeared. And many months later, the owner of that farm spoke to the leader of this group who were the opposition and said, what happened that night? You, you, your, your folk were about to attack my farm and suddenly they turned around. And he said, suddenly we saw soldiers dressed in white surrounding your home. And they got such a fright they turned and went the other way. And those were angels from God. That's been quoted in many books. I've heard many stories like that. Billy Graham's wife wrote a book on angels, how angels have intervened and helped people. Focus on promises, not explanations. Matthew Henry comments on these verses in the, in the English of his day, and he says, when we are magnifying the causes of our fear, we ought to possess ourselves with clear and great and high thoughts of God and the invisible world. As Romans 8.31 states, if God is for us, who can be against us? And Psalm 91 verse 11 says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. God is faithful to his promises towards us. And if we are faithful in obeying him, he'll be very faithful to us. And fearing him is the right way and living to honor him and bring him glory in everything we do. Sometimes God allows adverse circumstances in our lives for good reasons, we all know that, to challenge us as to our faith and dependence on him maybe, or a wake-up call from our complacency or self-righteousness or even pride, or for the exercise and development of our prayer life. And we must never forget we live in a very fallen world. We know that, what's going on around us, a very fallen world but God's in it with us. But we must never forget, as 1 John 4, 4 states, the one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Christ in us, greater than Satan in the world. As Elisha said, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And remember that verse when you go home today. Number one, the God who sees. Number two, the God who protects. And only in heaven one day will we realize how we've been protected by angels. And finally, number three, the God who shows mercy. Elisha didn't ask the Lord to command the angelic army to destroy Ben-Hadad's feeble troops. As with nations today, defeat only promotes retaliation. Ben-Hadad would have sent another company of soldiers. Remember a few weeks ago, there was the, the war going on between Palestine and Israel. We heard it. They were attacking each other. First of all, uh, Palestine attacked Israel. Then it, it Israel retaliated. Then Palestine sent another bomb, a few bombs and attacks, and Israel back again. It was like a tennis match. That's what happens in the world today. Retaliation, retaliation. God gave Elisha a much better plan. He had just prayed that God would open the servants' eyes, but now he prayed that God would close the eyes of the Syrian soldiers. And when the army arrived in Samaria, the guards must have been shocked to see the prophet leading the troops in. But they obediently opened the gates and God opened their eyes. Imagine their surprise when they find themselves in the heart of the capital city and at the mercy of the Israelites. The Israeli king expected Elisha, um, uh, respected Elisha, notice he called him my father in verse 21, and fed the Syrian soldiers. Instead of killing them, he fed them, gave them a meal. He knew that having a meal with them was the same as making a covenant with them. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 25, verse 21, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, 
give him water. It's like heaping burning coals on his head. The Lord will reward you. King Joram of Israel wanted to kill the Syrians, but Elisha killed them with kindness. By eating together, they made a covenant of peace, and the Syrian bands would no longer raid the borders of Israel, which didn't happen for, didn't happen for many, many years after that. The most glorious victory ever over an enemy is to turn him into a friend. But this can only truly happen in God's power. Matthew 5, 7 reminds us, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Elisha was in the center of God's will. We need to be there too. And then all things are possible with God. So friends, this morning, the battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. The battle is the Lord's. So if we are securely in God's army, we're okay. In the army of the God who sees everything. The God who protects. And the God who shows great mercy. Are you absolutely securely sure that you are in God's army this morning? I hope we can all say a resigning yes. But if there's somebody here, or perhaps at home, that's not absolutely 100% sure of that, you need to make sure of it. You need to today go to God and say, God, I want to be in your army. I've got to be in your army. I can't cope with this world without you. I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come into my life. I give you myself. Say the words that come into your mind, but just give yourself to God and repent and ask him into your life, and he'll do that. I'd hate anyone to miss out on heaven. If you can say yes today to being in God's army, then those who are with you are more than those who are with them. Let's pray. Almighty, we thank you for this encouragement from your word in the Old Testament. Thank you that you are the same God today as you were there, that your promises still stand, that you're a God of compassion, God who knows us thoroughly and accepts us despite ourselves, warts and all. Thank you that you love us despite ourselves, that you walk with each one of us daily. Lord, help us to just live so close to you and revere you and honor you and respect you and fear you in the right way. May you not be part of our lives, but may you be our lives daily, 24-7. Lord, thank you that you're with us, that we can face anything, anything ahead of us with you walking with us. So, Lord, we pray that you'd strengthen us today, whether we're here in person or at home. Lord, strengthen us, strengthen our faith. Help us to be the people you want us to be, more Christ-like, more faithful, stronger and bold as your people in this lost world. So, Lord, we pray that we would have been encouraged today and we would walk away from this service knowing that greater is he in us than he in the world. Help us to be conquerors with you. Lord, bless us, strengthen us, empower us, help us. And we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the thanks <laughs> because you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. You're a faithful God. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.